Uh, this one's going to be fun. Uh, we get to announce an old friend. Uh, David and I, uh, uh, before emceeing this event last year, we, we spent a lot of time emceeing an event that would take place in uh, a rotating Nordic uh, country uh, every year. Uh, it was called the Nordic Barista Cup. Uh, it's actually where we got to meet Jeffrey. Uh, and he, in, against his better judg judgment, invited uh, David and I to, to MC this. Um, but, uh, at least me personally, uh, the NBC was uh, the venue where I got to meet our next speaker um, and have been uh, friends with him ever since. Uh, he is uh, a student uh, of marketing and food science uh, from the University of Helsinki. He is the founder of uh, four different companies. Uh, uh, one uh, was Freze Coffee in Helsinki, it was a, a great coffee bar. Uh, currently, he uh, is the co-founder of Sudden Coffee. Uh, Sudden Coffee, as you'll hear, is uh, a new a new take on an old concept, I, I guess is a way to put it. Um, or as the New York Times put it, uh, was it instant coffee you'll actually want to drink. Uh, he's also had write-ups in uh, CNBC and uh, Food and Wine, I believe. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to present Kale Freze. Trouble or something, or like 
Well, so in the grand scheme of things, it's actually not that bad. So I started looking into different ideas what to do kind of through that lens. And finally, one idea that I zoomed into was instant coffee. I make an instant coffee that doesn't suck. Uh, I studied food science at university um, alongside marketing, so I had kind of an idea of how, how it was made. Also seen the stuff <coughs> that goes into instant coffee when it's kind of produced. So just kind of a quick recap. Um, this is what we wanted to do. So make a product that would be sort of combined special coffee with the convenience of instant coffee, because I think that would make like drinking good coffee a lot easier, making people day better through good coffee a lot easier. And then I did what any college dropout would do. Um, I moved to San Francisco and got a garage where I started making instant coffee uh, last October. It was literally a garage, which is so much where all the startups were. Um, and so instant coffee is dehydrated liquid coffee. So you get coffee, you brew it, and then you dehydrate it. And normally it's made with the intention of making it as much of like as much as possible for as little money as possible without necessarily paying so much attention to the quality, which is, can be a valid strategy if you want to make it. Um, but it basically means that you get the beans that nobody else wants. And when you brew the coffee, this concept of extraction yield is very important. It's probably the most important thing to know if you're a barista. And that means when you brew coffee, is that how much stuff you get out of the bean, I think. And that's your extraction yield. <coughs> And you pretty much want to be where the party is. Even in a party in, in this space, so somewhere around 20 and 25. That's when you get the sort of good, sweet flavor out of the coffee. If you're below that, you start getting these like sour, savory notes. And if you go too high, you start getting a lot of bitterness and you know. And this is kind of what instant coffee looks like right now. They brew the coffee twice, so you get basically uh, three times as much stuff out as you want. And that makes sense. You want to make a lot of it but it doesn't improve the quality. Uh, so that's not ideal. And then you run into this. Uh, <laughs> I did a small gallop of like, my Facebook friends on, on like, descriptions for instant coffee, and here's what we got. Like drinking the remains of medicine cabinet caught in a house fire. How like black coffee. And uh, this is a very special Finnish uh, kind of sausage. <laughs> That's not a positive descriptor of our coffee. Like, if you're trying to sell somebody good instant coffee, that's kind of like a definition of an oxymoron. Um, so what do we do? Uh, I moved to San Francisco. I started making instant coffee in a garage, and it tasted really good. And we kind of knew that there's some potential here. And we launched it early this year and had some kind of early traction, but uh, we should, we're kind of failing. The goal is to reach a large market, but we didn't really have to figure out how to do that yet. So we did what every startup would do and talk to our, to our customers with a bit of a customer study. So we talked with about 90 people, uh, like half an hour into interviews, to basically understand what problem can we solve for them, where is sort of their coffee problem or their coffee need. And we, Kind of created a bunch of personas um, to define these uh, segments, and then one we are going after is called Michelle. And so Michelle is somebody who likes good coffee. She's a millennial, you know, twenties or thirties, lives in an urban area, and drinks about two cups of coffee per day. She would describe the coffee as being lightly roasted, um, not any other descriptor, really, not necessarily that it's single origin or that it's from a certain country, but you heard sort of lightly roasted. And so she's interested in learning more about the coffee or what makes some coffee better. She spends $89 in coffee per month, and this is across 19 different cities and almost 100 people. So it's a lot of money. And what we found out that, so basically what she wants is, is good coffee conveniently and consistently. What she doesn't like is pretentiousness, elitism, and snobbism in coffee shops. This is something we've <coughs> like into a lot. So, kind of to recap, 
we have this big market of millennials who spend a lot of money on coffee, and, and as you probably know, everybody's, you probably want to go out for millennials, like me right now, because uh, I'm spending a lot of money on coffee. And they really, they think what we got out of it is that they just want to drink coffee consistently and conveniently. They don't want any of that sort of pretentiousness. And that often puts them off in some you know, specialty coffee shop. So based on this, we kind of created a model or framework to help ourselves think about this more effectively. So, so the order of, of needs that Michelle has. And the first one is caffeine. When it comes to coffee, for most of us, the first thing we actually need in one is caffeine. Whether we like it or not, we're addicted to it. And the second thing is ritual. So for Michelle, her morning coffee routine or ritual, as she described it, was kind of very important. She didn't want anybody or anyone to, to mess around with that. So whether it's brewing her coffee at home or grabbing it on her way to work, she kind of had that fixed. And, uh, especially then sort of the pretentiousness uh, create kind of some conflict. Now after these, um, it's sort of the social aspect of the coffee. Whether it's sharing a coffee with a friend or going to a coffee shop and being treated nicely. Um, fault is brand, and they're basically like, how do you, how do you uh, see yourself as a, as a customer of a brand versus how, what do you think other people think of you if you walk on a street and you want to with a Starbucks coffee cup or a blue bottle coffee cup? And then finally, the specialty, or that's the best word we've time for it yet. This basically represents when Michelle's drinking coffee, what are her needs? So the first one is caffeine. And if you don't, if she doesn't get caffeine when she wants it, none of the other stuff matters. Like zero. <coughs> and if you've ever studied psychology, you might realize that this is fairly close to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is kind of a classic theory of the needs that sort of dictate human's behavior. So we named it Fraser's hierarchy of coffee drinkers. But basically, sort of seeing the interaction through this lens uh, helps to realize what matters to her and when. And kind of based on this study, we realized that we don't want to get into her sort of first cup uh, of the day because that's part of our routine or ritual, but rather to the second cup, which might be after lunch. If she gets time, she can go to the coffee shop, uh, but more often she doesn't. And they were kind of struggling with that. When to get, where to get good coffee, if there's no coffee shops around, if there's only craft coffee at work. And that's kind of where we realize it's a huge potential for something like such a coffee, which you can keep with you, you can mix it with any liquid really, uh, whether it's hot or cold, and enjoy a cup of great coffee wherever you are. So I think this is the sort of future of coffee uh, in some ways. I don't really, I guess, strongly believe in the uh, way to build coffee, uh, but I, I have a couple ideas why this is sort of the next big thing in coffee. And I was also thinking that if I'm sharing this with you, it might not be the smartest move for us, because we might do the same. <laughs> or basically pitching you that there's a huge market here. Then I realized that, I mean, that's the goal. And I don't think that's a way for anybody. And I think if a ton of other coffee companies realize that there's a huge potential in making instant coffee that tastes great and selling it to people in a main way that makes sense for them, is a great way to help one million people drink better coffee and get their taste better, whether it's me or somebody else. Or me. And so here's basically the winning recipe why I think uh, it's very interesting. So basically when you blend the specialty coffee that's currently having a, a great brand, tastes great, has a fairly high margin. That's why we're all getting to that, because there's more margin in there. And it's growing rapidly. On the other hand, other hand you have instant coffee, which is basically built and designed to scale. We're struggling because we're making it in tiny scale. We started by me in this super cold garage, making shots of espresso by hand that we can dehydrate. 
And we kind of scale that to a point where we have one full-time person doing that all the time. And um, figuring out how to do that in larger scale uh, has not been trivial. It has untapped convenience, it's super cheap to transport, and it has a great shelf life. From time perspective, capsules are basically just in coffee, but you need a machine. Sometimes you don't have a machine, and then you don't have the space for it. Um, I would never want to have a machine at home. They're ugly, and they don't, frankly, make great coffee, except Maxwell's coffee. <laughs> Which are actually delicious. I can totally just do that. Um, but still, you need the machine. This is coffee you can have anywhere uh, with you. And you can, I mean, it's still, from time perspective, instant. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I guess that's, that's all I have. Uh, I think uh, we're seeing that this is the sort of the largest market, potentially a, mar a very large market, sort of largest paradigm shift in specialty coffee or in coffee industry since the introduction of capsules by Nespresso 25 years ago. I think by doing this, we can reach a completely new audience and put specialty coffee in a form that's much more approachable initially to a million people. Thank you very much. Questions for the man up on stage. Oh my goodness, you, you're going to win a prize for most questions asked. So, <laughs> so I, I came here for your presentation, actually. Uh, I've been following you, um, and of course, because I like Jeffrey and Allegra, it's fantastic. Uh, but I was very interested in, in the work that you've been doing. I ordered your stuff online and it got delivered. <clears throat> and uh, I also carry one, carry one with me. Um, and, and I think it tastes delicious. Uh, so I've got one, I've got two questions, but both are problems that I was hoping you could uh, help me surmount. First problem is the coffee didn't taste as good on the plane. Uh, and that's because the plane water is shit. Um, and so we have this great coffee, but 90% of it's water. And if I'm on a plane, it's still shit. It's better than the plane coffee, so in a relative scale, I'm still winning. So I'm on the head of the bell curve, but it's still, so I've got to sort out the water issue. But in terms of <clears throat> the work that you do, we've, we've made some instant coffee ourselves and it's labor intensive. And there are about seven companies in the world that make instant coffee, none of them are based anywhere I live. Um, and they have a terrible extraction model and so on and so on. So when you've got you know, an espresso in the house and those kind of budgets, how do specialty coffee guys like us compete with um, that scale? So water and scale. Right. Uh, the water is the problem that I haven't solved yet. So uh, Pete Legata, who was the world first champion in 2013, um, just met him with a couple of weeks ago and then gave him some cubes and he did a kind of a comparison on the plane. He had taken, he brought his own water from the Starbucks at the airport to the plane. So you have with, with better water. Uh, I don't have a problem like a solution for that yet. The plain water sucks. Uh, the best way probably is to bring bottled water and just mix it cold because it does mix in cold water as well. Um, unless you have a way to heat it, but might be too much. In terms of the, I guess what you're asking is how do specialty guys uh, get off to us like how over the barrier of entry to the market. Um, well, I mean, that's what we've been doing kind of for the past six months to a year. Um, for sure, you're going to need like money for that. And I was thinking of speaking more about why why we figure out figure this out and not some other people uh, who might have basically infinite resources to convert to a, a tiny startup that's raised a little bit of money. But I think the key key things here are that sort of the vision that's driving what we're doing. Like that's the whole thing we do. Um, coffee, I mean our goal is to make people day better and coffee is just a tool to get there. And I think we're going, to, well I mean so it's vision, then it's also uh, the, the constraints that the resources create, or the lack of resources creates. Which means that you gotta figure shit out a different way. Which can be really frustrating, but then you look into other solutions um, how that can be done. Um, I'd love to go into specifics, but 
because I cheated in front of you. Get out of here anymore. Uh, basically, so I guess the short answer is that you have to be driven by something. Um, you have to be driven, have to have sort of the vision and mission of, of making something big happen. Uh, it's about the iteration cycle of speed. So I got the first dispatches of this out in my university in Helsinki end of August last year. In September, we had the first money raised in San Francisco, in October I moved there, um, and in December we sold the first copy. And we've basically been doubling our production and sales every month from there. So the iteration speed you can do as a startup when you're very small and nimble is basically being just myself and my co-founder, and now we hired three people back <coughs> working for almost a year by three of us. And you can do something, take it out, ask people how you like it, and then make changes. Um, and you can iterate so much faster. So now we already have a great product we can produce at scale, and people love it. Um, and it, you, you wouldn't be able to come up with that through a really intense like, R&D process. But uh, it's not sort of still the easiest thing to do. Um, you know, and you need a little bit of luck, <laughs> as always. That was a bad answer. It's not an easy question to ask. Excuse me, let's cut you here. So, um, a quick question. Um, Six dollars a cup is obviously not where you. We're at two fifty now. You're at two fifty now. So, I guess the question is, where do you think you need to get to for this to be the product, and what do you think your product is going to be? Right. What price and what is, what's the end goal? So starting actually coming back to the previous question, we got into price, so we started making it by hand, it was costing us $11 to produce one cup. My co-founder is like Stanford or McKinsey consultant, so he actually had the spreadsheets. <laughs> so it was basically $11 and then we got it down to six and we started selling it at $6 a cup to figure out that if somebody wants to buy it, if somebody wants to buy it at $6 a cup and they still like it, they probably want to buy it at lower price. But there's a lot more people want to be buying at lower price. And once we've been scaling and getting better at it, we've been dropping the price, and we're now at $250 a cup. And ultimately, where we want to be is, I guess, rather than giving out a, a specific number, I'd say that our vision is creating a product that is as good as you get. I mean, realistically, it's never going to be better than a really well done impression for coffee, just due to the nature of the process. But it's already better than 90% of the coffee that I get given at the like specialty cafes. It's very consistent, uh, it doesn't age as the batch brew does. And so the margin of error is like very hard to just brew on the brewing from our stack, which is cool about it. So I guess what we're gonna be is, is basically having a great cup of coffee for half the price we can pay at a coffee shop or even lower, and you can have it anywhere. Um, and in terms of the products, I mean, for now we're using like literally the best coffee you can buy. Um, we're paying like $8 per pound for the coffee, which is for the roasted coffee, which is very, uh, it's, a, it's a very high price for instant coffee. And so we're kind of doing single origins now and then probably some kind of a blend stuff later that would be a little cheaper. But I think that we're able to, well, basically one to 150 is where I think it's really gonna be kind of disruptive. And we have a plan to get there. By, by That would be one way of going, but we're more interested in creating basically a vertically integrated um, semi coffee company. So, but for now, I mean, we're three people, so we don't want to be roasting right now. But it's not the biggest problem we're going to solve right now. I have a question uh, just on the, the product development and, and I guess the QC of the product. I'm sure that there's been times where you're at your facility and you're cupping uh, the whole bean coffee and then you're right side by side tasting the same coffee through the process. Uh, true? Yes. Yes. So in, in your experience with that, what are some of the things that you notice take a hit uh, through, through the process? Like is it the body, is it the sweetness, the acidity, what is it? That's a good question. 
So uh, initially I thought it's going to be just kind of a muted and, and uh, frankly like worse mm -hmm. version of the whole game copy. But I don't think that's the case anymore. When you go through a process, you always, basically the acidity drops down. So you, the acidity gets muted, but we've noticed that the, the body and the sweetness increases a lot. And it's a very kind of pleasant mouth people. And I think that's one of the sort of large opportunities we have, or, or kind of upside, is that even though, personally myself, and then sort of a lot of other races prefer more lighter roast and acidic coffees, but it's still kind of a foreign acquired, foreign kind of tasting coffee to a, a, more of a mainstream consumer. And that's one of the reasons why cold brew is so successful, although it, in my opinion, um, is not a good product. Cold water is not good for brewing coffee. And so, when when we make a setting coffee, uh, it becomes kind of much more uh, approachable. But it's sweeter, it's more balanced, it has a bigger body, and a lot of our customers actually prefer that over the fresh bean coffee when we've been giving them samples side by side blind. Any other questions in the room? David, can you grab? I'm, I'm hogging the question. Sorry, I'm just really interested. The aroma. Um, I feel like the aroma is not captured in the same way that when you brew coffee yeah, from an espresso. Have you got a, a solution for the aroma? Yeah. Capturing aroma and try to keep in, keeping it there throughout the process is not trivial. Uh, you need very elaborate set of equipment for that, and we're working on it. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. You lose a lot of the aroma. It doesn't smell the same. And I mean, my dream is that we can. It may be probably just some kind of way of preserving all or most of the other kind of coffee. Yes, question here. Why did you choose espresso? Well, for to start with, uh, there's nothing like intrinsically great about espresso. It just has higher TDS. So it's a higher concentration. And when you dehydrate something, or especially if you freeze dry, you can only put so much stuff in there. And the less water you have, the better. But did you try to do that with a drip or more concentrated kind of pour over? I don't know. Yeah, but it's basically impossible to get to decent extraction and temperament TDS without brewing it as espresso, without having great equipment. All right, ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for Colorado Crazy.